Tonight, we start here at home. More than half the communities in Canada, you may not be surprised to hear, that are not connected to the power grid are indigenous. They're very often remote, some facing heartbreaking challenges, made even worse by energy poverty. Joining us now for a look at the energy challenge for indigenous communities here in the province of Ontario, we welcome Isidore Day. He is Ontario Regional Chief for the Chiefs of Ontario. Judith Sayers, former elected chief of the Hupachasath First Nation in BC, now a professor at the University of Victoria Faculty of Law. Cynthia Wesley Eskimo, Vice Provost for Aboriginal Initiatives at Lakehead University in Thunder Bay. Christopher Henderson, President of Lumos Energy and a clean energy advisor to numerous Aboriginal communities in Canada. He's also the author of Aboriginal Power. And Mitchell Daibo, Secretary Treasurer at the Casabonica Lake Community Development Corporation. And I would ask our friends here in the Mike Lazaridis Theater of Ideas to welcome our guests here to Waterloo today. Thank you. Just let me add my words of welcome as well, everybody, particularly Judith, you came all the way from British Columbia to be with us today. Thank you so much. Let's just put some facts on the table here that will sort of set the table for our discussion to come. Sheldon, if you would, this graphic, please. There are about 300 communities in Canada that are not connected to the North American electrical grid. And of those 300, 175 are indigenous communities, many of which rely on diesel generators for their power. 25 of those off-grid indigenous communities are here in the province of Ontario, to which Chief Day recently said, our people are living in substandard living conditions. We need to bring our communities into the 21st century. Substandard is not a standard that we can live with any longer. Chief Day, just before I pose my first question to you, let us acknowledge that we are here on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee people, this being the Haldeman Tract, so we acknowledge that for everybody in this audience and for our viewers at home as well. What relationship do you see between the living conditions in off-grid communities and the lack of reliable energy? Well, uh, Steve, thank you for having us and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, you know, I, I reflected on this uh, some weeks back and I, I looked at the issue of water, for example, and what, what water is to the human body. We know that that's what electricity is to society. And, and we're now seeing more and more, as you indicated in the, your opening remarks, that you know, many communities that, that are indigenous are uh, in fact living without electricity. And again, uh, you know, to, to the common person that lives in the mainstream that have you know, maybe second, third generation access to electricity, they, they don't know the current struggles that are being faced in the North. Uh, today, for example, uh, you know, we're still reeling from the, uh, the, the fire that took the lives of nine uh, people in Pekanjikum First Nation, one of the remote communities, and one of the central issues and causes is the fact that th they're not on the grid. Uh, they don't have electricity. I'm going to go to Cynthia on that very case. In Pekanjikum, for example, they get their power through diesel. How does that affect the community, the fact that they have to get their power from diesel? Well, it affects it greatly. I mean, one of the things that we were trying to do after the coroner's report came out was to actually get water to the communities inside the houses. This and is the coroner's report on? On, on, on Pekanjikum in 2008. And when we actually got the, the, them up there, the generators were too old to actually be able to accommodate that. So here we've got all of the facility to make it happen. The generators are old, they can't be replaced, and we are not hooked up to Red Lake, which is about 80 kilometers away. Wh why not? Hmm. That's a big question I think the Canada has to answer. We're going to explore some of those answers during the course of our hour tonight. Mitchell, let me go to you next. You live in one of those 25 off-grid communities, right? Where's uh, Casabonica Lake? Casabonica Lake is uh, about 500 miles far north of Ontario. It's between uh, Webequay and KI, or what's known as Big Trout Lake. That's actually not going to help too many people understand <laughs> where it is. <laughs> Northwestern, northeastern Ontario? Yes, it's, it's northwestern Ontario. Northwestern, it's, so north yeah. of Thunder Bay. That's correct. How far north of Thunder Bay? 500 miles. 500 miles that's north right. of Thunder Bay. Okay, that's up there. How does your energy predicament affect how you are able to live your life there? Well, being on diesel-generated power, at least we have a, a reliable distribution company there, Hydro One Remote Communities, that we work with. Um, and what we suffer from would be blackouts, brownouts, and load restrictions. When the diesel plant is maxed out, there's no more growth in the community, nothing more can be hooked to distribution. Like we were just on a period from 2007 to 2015, 
no new housing, no new buildings, no new anything. Yet the population growth continues, families are formed, and overcrowding continues. That's the reality of uh, maximum capacity of diesel power. Chris, you've looked at it in your book, Aboriginal Power. Uh, how does it affect people's lives across this country if they're off the grid? It affects them in unique and powerful ways, negative ways. Socially, what it means, the community doesn't have the power for economic development. Jobs are hard to maintain or keep or even have. Socially, you have health effects where people are relying on diesel fuel for their heating and also diesel for their power. And as a result, you have indoor air quality issues, respiratory issues, and that force. Economically, when you don't have that power, you can't offer a place where companies can get established because they don't know if the power is going to be on. As Mitchell indicated, if there's a load restriction, you can't keep your company operating, so companies don't get established. And environmentally, Steve, diesel fuel is really bad for climate change. It mm -hmm. emits heavy greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. So this is a triple whammy here for these communities that are socially, economically, and environmentally very negative when you're relying on diesel power. We're going to talk about health impacts as well, uh, which we have not referred to yet. But Judith, before we do that, I do want to get your sense of how it is in British Columbia as well. We've been sort of talking about Ontario examples up until now. How does it affect people in British Columbia? The same way. Uh, there are many coastal communities that do not have access to the grid, uh, many that are far away from the grid, uh, isolated communities, communities that you have to fly into, or there may be snow roads. But, you know, noise is one of those issues. I think that people have to live with a noisy generator, the fear of diesel spills into precious lakes or sacred sites, you know, and, and just feeling like, you know, you're living in the second class conditions or third world conditions that why are you different than a community 100 miles down the road? Well, let's try if, see if we can answer that question. Chris, again, uh, working on your expertise on this, does this situation persist for technical reasons or political reasons? Uh, the simple answer is both. Um, mm -hmm. If the political will was there, we'd probably solve the technical reasons. Uh, generating power from rene renewable sources or sources that are off diesel is not easy to do. But the fact of the matter, it takes investment. Just like a lot of things in the north, investment's not there. Investment has not been there, by and large, to convert diesel communities to renewable energy or improve energy conservation and efficiency. So I think you need both. You need political will to move, and you need the technical will and the know-how to provide the solutions. If you were able to bring those things to bear, how long would it take to kind of take some steps in the right direction? A lot faster than people think. Yeah. Uh, you can make a very quick impact in a year or two with many communities with improved energy management, community energy planning, and energy efficiency. And then over the medium term, two, three, four, five years, look at where there are renewable options for communities and bring those online. If we bring the politics and the economics together, great things can happen. Hmm. Somebody, sorry, Chief Data, did you want to add something? Yeah, there? certainly. I, I think the, the point is well taken. I think uh, when we look at investment, I, I believe it's more than just the monetary sense of investment. And, and it's, it's about the planning and ensuring that, you know, perhaps even the, the jurisdictional situation that exists in the south may not be the same that is needed in the north. For example, uh, you have Attawapiskat First Nation who right now, uh, now has a, an energy through the Five Nations Energy line that went up a, a number of years back. But what they don't have is they, they, they don't have access to the wealth that the diamonds are pulling out of the region. So this whole notion of uh, exploitation policy that's been around for well over uh, a number of uh, maybe uh, uh, 60 years, you know, it, it, things have changed here in society. And, and you know, you, you, you cannot have the municipalized model in the north where First Nations are prevalent. What you really need to be looking at is how does the First Nation fix into the, the issue of jurisdiction? How, do they, how can they take the wealth from the territories and actually build and sustain communities? Mm -hmm. Cynthia. And, and how, well, also, I think part of the problem that we have as a country is that we've never really recognized those communities the way they should have been recognized. They're, you know, they established artificial communities, and they've said, you know, these people have to live up here, and they're not, they're not a part of Canada in the mm. same way that everybody else is. We managed to populate this entire country from east to west. There's absolutely no reason we can't go north to south as well. But Professor. we have to make sure that we, we bring them into the country. Professor Sayers. I just wanted to mention that Indian and Northern Affairs Canada, I guess Indigenous Northern Affairs Canada now, cut out their remote community program. And so BC Hydro did the same thing, although they have an obligation to provide service to everybody in British Columbia. So what was that about program? The remote community electrification program. 
So both of them, the federal government cut it and then the provincial government cut it. So no political will, no political finances. And then within the province of British Columbia, there's also a policy that you can't use new technology unless it's been used um, for three years, somewhere under three projects. And so if we wanted to bring in something like kite technology or something to these remote communities, unless it's been tested and tested the way BC Hydro likes it, we won't be able to use it. So we need change in policy. We need that political will to open up laws and policies so that we can bring power into remote communities a lot easier. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.